Chad. Turn with me this morning, if you would, to 1 Samuel chapter 17. While you turn, let me share some information with you. There have been over 15,000 people who have been visitors on our webpage. How about that? 8.4 hours watched each week. 523 views per week. So we're reaching people. We're reaching out there. And you can go on if you're sick some Sunday and you can't be here. You can go home that afternoon. Mr. Garrison puts that on. He edits it. And in case I tell jokes that are not suitable, uh, he edits all that. And it'll be on about one, what, 2 o'clock, I guess. Uh, about 2 o'clock, I think. Anyway, it'll be on there and you can watch the sermon if you can't be here. All right, I think that's just phenomenal, though, a wonderful tool for, uh, for ministry. All right, I'm going to talk to you today about, uh, about a, two people in the Bible that are probably the most familiar with us from the time we were small children, just little, little kids. We knew about something. This happened uh, about 3,000 years ago. There was a, a war going on on the Western Front with the children of Israel and with the Philistines, which they fought all the time. So the atmosphere in that day was filled with hostility. It was filled with hate, pretty much like the world that we live in today. So I want to share with you about these two uh, characters who lived a long time ago. So why is that so important? Well, it must be important to God because he gave a whole chapter here to these two individuals and to the two uh, countries as well. 58 verses from chapter 17 uh, talk about this event that we're going to talk about. 912 Hebrew words as well. So it must be important. It must be important to have that much attention uh, in their Bible. And it's the most famous battle that's ever gone on in the world, but it wasn't between two nations. It was between two individuals, David and Goliath. Now, we learned that from the time we were small kids in school. But you know what? There's so many lessons for us in that story, and I want to share with that with you today. There's so many things for the time that we're living in today. There was a big obstacle that faced the children of Israel. That obstacle was a guy uh, that we call Goliath, nine feet, nine inches tall. Isn't that something? That's what they say the height of his was. NBA would sure love to have him today, wouldn't they? His head three inches from the top of the goal, you know. And so he had caused nothing but havoc as well as the Philistines upon the nation of Israel. So there was an obstacle. They had an obstacle. David had no problem with that because he didn't look at the obstacle. He looked at God. Folks, we have a lot of obstacles right now. We have a lot of strongholds. We have a lot of things going on in our world today and in our nation and our county and our city we live in today that we've never dealt with before. We've never dealt with this before except last year, and now it looks like it's worse this year. So there are, there are objects out there that are bigger than us. Sometimes we're intimidated by this stuff. We can't live in fear, though. And so... They face an obstacle. So there's some lessons I want us to learn from this because a lot of detail is given about this. So rather than read the verses and then go back through, what I want to do today for the sake of time uh, is to just cover these verses as we go through and look at this as an exciting account of what happened 3,000 years ago. David was born in 1020 before Christ. So we see it's been 3,000 years uh, since all this happened. Now, the place it happened is about 15 miles from Bethlehem. We're familiar with Bethlehem in the Bible, uh, not far from Jerusalem there. It's close to Jerusalem as well. So this is the area that this happened in. So where was David from? That's where David was from, was it not? He was from the, uh, the city of Bethlehem, which is about 15 miles west of this little village that we're going to look at uh, today. Probably uh, this, this uh, valley where the one side was the Israelites, the other side of the mountain or the, of the, for the valley uh, was the children of Israel. Now, this valley was about a mile wide. That's what 
they tell us today that it's about a mile wide. So could you imagine they're over here jawing with each other about this battle, about what was going to take place, and until the, the giant Goliath comes out there, and he's going to give them a challenge. We pick that up in verse number 2, and now down to verse number 4. This is in the Valley of Elah. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of stuff went on there as well. So one side the armies of uh, Israel, and the other side the armies of uh, uh, the Philistines. There's a lot of anxiety in the camp of Israel. And the reason, because verse 4 tells us, the reason they had that anxiety is because there was a champion there named Goliath. Now, Goliath was a bully. That's who he was. He was a bully. He intimidated people uh, by his size, for one thing. Can you imagine that? How intimidating that be, someone who's nine, uh, nine feet tall. And so there's intimidation in that. I heard a coach say a few years ago, about 10 or 12 years ago, there was a team came up here from Tennessee. And I'm telling you, these, these players just kept getting off that bus. I mean, just more and more. And you think, man, I, I think it was uh, Knoxville East, I believe it was. I don't know how many they brought with them, but there, there must have been 120 or 30 players they brought with them. And so the guy said the reason they do that is for intimidation. You know, if they just got off the bus and had the number of players that played on the team plus uh, some substitutes, then that wouldn't have been too intimidating. But when you have these players, and 90% of them probably weren't even going to play, but they were there with the team, and so that's intimidating. So we have a guy here that's intimidating. Uh, he, could you imagine that sight just to look at him, how intimidating uh, he'd be? Now, verse number 5, and we're going to walk through some of these verses, and we're going to stop every now and then and draw some spiritual uh, reasoning from them about where you and I are today, perhaps in your Christian walk. Now, David, talk about the mind that he just think about the mind of Christ. David was focused on the God in heaven. He was within the will of God. Folks, when you are within the will of God, you're safe. Nothing's going to happen. You Nothing can get to you when you're in the very will of God, and that's where that we want to be. So it describes him here in verse number 5. So we're going to kind of go through this fast, so follow along in your Bible. And let's recount a story that's an old, old story, but let's look at and bring that in to the day where we are today. Verse number 5 says there he had a, an armor of brass. He had a helmet of brass, a coat of mail made of brass. So some estimate that, and that coat of mail is, means that he has a covering in his front. That weighs about 125 pounds. Now, could you imagine that? It would be all we could do to carry it around, and it was just a piece, a piece of clothing for him. Verse 6 said that they had the brass legs that covered his legs in front. He had a spear with a head of iron that weighed about 25 pounds. Now, could you imagine that? The spear that he used weighed about 25 pounds. Now, we're going to see in a few minutes when David went up with Goliath, he was offered a spear to use. But David didn't use that spear. What did he use? He used a slingshot, didn't he? We'll get to that in just a moment. So, uh, here's all this stuff he has. He's a uh, uh, he's a giant of a man, uh, psychological warfare. I mean, the children of Israel were, were afraid of all this. Verse 8, 9, and 10 talks about, these three verses talked about this guy who was boasting in his speech. I mean, uh, uh, he, was, he was intimidating the children of Israel because of his size and because of his bullying and what he had to say. And uh, so people were afraid. They were, they were afraid. Now, Verse number 10, look at that, was a scary scene. Uh, they were scared to death, out of their minds. And he said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that, will, that may fight together. So here's fear in the hearts of all these soldiers. And by the way, Saul, Saul was a tremendous, he was king in that day. He was a tremendous military man, Saul was. Saul was a big guy as well. He wasn't nine feet tall, but Saul was a very tall guy. Uh, 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 he was just a military guy. He was tough as nails. He wouldn't go against this Goliath, neither would any of the children of Israel. They didn't want to face this problem that they had before him. Are we not that way sometimes? You know, we'd like to turn our head and, and pray that all this stuff that's going on now, of our friends who have COVID and, and been through all this stuff, we, you know, we just like to turn our head and think that'll go away. Well, it's not going to go away, you know? It's out there. So we have to be sensible, do the smart things in order to get this stopped so that we can get on in life. So there's some lessons in life that I want us to look at as we go through this together because we encounter giants in our life. We encounter sometimes 
health issues in our life. We encounter other problems on the job, and uh, on and on we could go about obstacles that we encounter as we go through life. We all do that. We have difficulty sometimes. We have financial problems sometimes, and we have all these things, and, and we dread to deal with those, but they are a reality. This is a reality right here we're looking at today. David is going to challenge this guy by the name of Goliath. It's a reality. It's a true story. Not fiction, this is a true story. So there's some lessons that we need to learn because our obstacles in life come in a variety of sizes. <laughs> They're not all that big. There's some small, some medium, some large. But let me ask you a question, and we'll just stop here for a second. What is there in your life right now? What situation or circumstance are you dealing with in your life that's like a Goliath in your life? That's like a hindrance in your life, things that's bothering you in your life? things that challenge you perhaps. Let me tell you what to do with all of those. Take those to God. I spoke with a lady the other night on the phone. I spoke to her yesterday about a situation that happened the other night. The first thing she did, she went and got on her knees before God and prayed. Folks, that's faith. That's strong faith. That's what we should do. But here's what we do. We look at the obstacles in life. We look at the giants that face us in life. Rather than focusing on God, we focus on them. And what happens? They get bigger and bigger and bigger. You see, we're, we are to focus not on the problem, but we are to focus on God who can solve that problem. That's who we should be focusing on. All right. It's because those things intimidate us in life. You know, we, we wake up in the morning or we can't go to sleep at night when we deal with these things in life. Now, verse number 12, <clears throat> we're going to see David's confession. Now, let me tell you a little bit about David. He was the eighth son of Jesse. He had been anointed already to be the new king. That's what was going to happen. Remember, Samuel went out there and anointed him. Uh, Saul took David in. Saul was the king. He was jealous of the David because of David killing his thousands or ten thousands and Saul just his thousands. So he was well known in, the day, in these days of King Saul. <coughs> Saul. <coughs> As a matter of fact, he played music for King Saul. He, uh, he would come because music is soothing. First Samuel 15, I believe, tells us that, that music is soothing to the soul, and it's healing to the soul sometimes. We do that, do we not? We play soft music sometimes. All the department stores have soft music when you go in. There's a reason for that, because that is soothing uh, to the soul. Now, that's what David did. Now, let's move on quickly. So, uh, Jesse already had three sons that were serving there uh, in the military. Eliab in verse 13, Abinadad, and Shammah. And so verse 14 tells us that David was the youngest of his sons, and his brothers didn't want him to be there. Now, in that day, you had to be 20 years of age to be in the military. David was only 19 when this happened, and so he could not be in the military. So his older brother said, you need to go back home and take care of the sheep. That's where you need to be because they cared about their brother, and they didn't want him there because it was dangerous, but he was there because he brought some items for his three brothers who were there, uh, brought them some items so that they could have some food. So, verse 15, but David went and returned from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So, here he is, a musician on, on Saul's staff, and he's going to have to deal with this because Saul was dealing with demons in his life. Now, verse 16, he said, and the Philistines drew near morning and evening and presented himself 40 days. The Philistine, of course, talking about Goliath. Could you imagine that? Every morning, here's the Israelites over here, the Philistines over here, and this big giant comes down the valley and challenges them to come down. He's telling them to send some man, just send some person, and that's what they did oftentimes those days. They would send the, the, the biggest, the greatest military soldier they had would go against the greatest military soldier that another a tribe would have. They would do a battle, and whoever won, then the other one became submission uh, to them. So now for 40 days, for 40 days, he challenged them. Could you imagine that? To listen to that 40 days. We have verse 17. David had brought his brothers some parched corn and 10 loaves of Kroger bread. And so, in other words, David is playing some kind of... Uh, there wasn't any Kroger in that day, by the way. It was rainbow bread. And so David is kind of like a support role uh, to these people. Now verse 18. And he says, look how 
thy brethren fair and take their pledge. In other words, bring back some assurance that they're doing pretty good. Well, uh, David comes expecting to see a battle, but uh, uh, there was just some shouting going on. They were shouting back and forth, and Goliath was shouting to them. And so here they are, the children of Israel are intimidated by, by all this. Now, verse 24, drop down to verse 24. This is when David really comes on the, on the scene. You know, I noticed this. David stands up when everybody else sits down. He just, you know, we studied not long ago about we're to stand firm in the Lord, stand fast in the Lord. That's exactly what he did. And you know what? Because of that, God blessed him. If we will do the same thing, we need to stand firm in our faith. We need to keep the faith. We, we cannot allow these things to distract us. Distract us from what? For reaching people for Jesus Christ. Is that not why we're here on 830? Is that not why God has placed us here to reach people for, that need to hear the gospel? That's what we are to do, and we cannot be distracted by anything else. <clears throat> Verse 24, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, they fled from him and were so afraid. Verse 25, now we see old David walks up, and the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that's come up, surely to defy Israel? Uh, and it shall be that the man who killeth him, the king will enrich him. In other words, King Saul was going to give him great riches. Listen to this, going to give him his daughter to marry. Now, whoever married the king's daughter was exempt from taxes. They didn't have to pay taxes anymore. In this case right here, they would be getting a lot of money. Now, that girl would have to be awful ugly for somebody not to take that up. And so anybody would take up a deal uh, like that. To be married to the king's daughter, you'd have it made for the rest of your life. You could just fish. All you want to do, just fish the rest of your life if you wanted to. So that's pretty good incentive, is it not? Now, verse 26, David hears all this stuff, and he says to those around him, make sure that, uh, that they'd heard it. He said, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he talking about Goliath, should defy the armies of the living God. So David has got the truth of the whole picture here. This guy is not going to intimidate David. Neither should anybody or anything intimidate us. We're on the winner's side. We're on the victor's side. You know, we don't fight from that. Uh, from, we don't right, fight for victory. We fight from it because the victory has already been won. Just go on and read the rest of the book and you'll see that. So, here he is, David uh, sees the reality of all this, and this Israeli armies are, they're giant dominated. They're dominated by this guy by the name of Goliath, and uh, that's, that's who he is. So they're looking at Goliath, and you know what they're saying? They're saying that, that he's bigger than any of us, you know? He's, man, look at this guy. Look how tall he is. He's bigger than anything that we've ever seen. And you know what? David is looking at Goliath. You know what he's saying? He's saying he's smaller than my God. How big is your God? How big really is your God? You know, sometimes we narrow God down on what he can do and, and what he can't do. Oftentimes we deal with things in life and we deal with it rather than taking it to God because we either think that maybe this is something he's not interested in in our life or maybe he can't handle it. Let me tell you, anything that you deal with in life, I don't care what it is in life, no matter what it is, God is greater than that. Always remember that. So the first thing that we should do rather than going out and buying someone's book to see how they dealt with this or, or listening to Dr. Phil oh, or any of this stuff, then we need to just see what God has to say about it. What does God have to say about these things uh, in our life? So David is looking at Goliath and he said, hey, <laughs> this guy's not bigger uh, than, than my God. So you see, he wasn't dwelling on the giant. Neither should we. Neither should we dwell on the issues that we have in life. Some of us have gone through cancer. We've gone through, we had to take radiation perhaps or chemo and all these. Those things overwhelm us sometimes. We lose a loved one and we're overwhelmed. We don't think we will ever smile or laugh again because our, our loved one's gone. We all deal with those things in life and they're bigger in life to us. They overwhelm us and we think, how can I get through this? Well, there's a God in heaven who's greater than anything he knows our hurt. He knows everything that's going on with us. And he is ready to meet that need in our life. We just, we just trust him is what that we do. So David basically is saying, who does this guy think he is to defy my God? 
Who does this guy think he is to, the, to defy my children of Israel, my family, the children of Israel? So you know what? David is ready to go. I mean, he is ready to go after this guy uh, right now because he knows there's a living God in heaven who's going to take care of him. So in 32, basically what he's saying there is, let me at this guy. Now, why doesn't King Saul go? Since King Saul is the king, why didn't he go? Let me tell you why he didn't go, because he's outside the will of God. Back in that day, the Spirit would come upon people to anoint them to do certain things. That's what, the, that's what happened in the Old Testament. Now, when the Holy Spirit comes into our life, he doesn't leave. That was before Jesus Christ back in those days, and God would anoint people to do things. So there's a, often a debate, was Saul saved? Was he ever saved? I don't think King Saul was ever a saved man. I hope I'm wrong about that, but the readings I read about him, I don't think he was ever saved because it doesn't give an indication that he ever had that relationship. Now, he was anointed to be king, but he was never a man who knew God in a personal way. So he was out of the will of God. Folks, when you're out of the will of God and you attempt things in your life, it's just not going to work. It's just not, God's not going to bless us if we're out of his will. How, how could he? How could he be a holy, righteous God and bless us if we're not where we need to be with him? So Saul was out of the will of God. Was David? No, absolutely not. David wasn't out of the will of God. And so Saul was afraid because he was outside the will of God. If we're living for the Lord, then our, when our problems come, we're not going to be afraid. But if we're not living for the Lord, if we're not where we need to be with Him, and these things come in our life, then we're going to be afraid. I mean, that's just that's all there is to it. All right, verse 32. So here's Saul. He's scared to death to do anything. He offers all this stuff, you know, whoever kills him, get all this money, get my daughter, and all this, you know. So David says to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. He says, thy servant will go, and I'll fight with this Philistine. In other words, he's saying, don't worry about a thing, king. I'll take care of it. Just don't worry about a thing. Let me go. Well, verse 33, Saul looks at this young David, and he looks at that big giant, Goliath, and he says, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. In other words, Goliath's been fighting all of his life. And he said, David, you're just a... You're just a 19-year-old boy. You're not even old enough to be in the army. And you're going to go against this Goliath, this guy that's nine feet tall? You're, going to get, you're, not, you're not ready for all that. You're just a, the Bible says that David was a, was a red-headed boy, probably, a red-haired, not a red-head, red-haired uh, boy, uh, ruddy complexion, strong, physical built, evidently, you know. So listen to what he said to him. He reminds King Saul what God had done for him already. Folks, let me tell you, when you deal with things in your life, remember what God has already done in your life. Remember the past victories that you've had in your life. Remember how he was there with you and got you through when you lost that loved one. How he got you through when you went through a time of health issues, when you dealt with other things on the job or at home or wherever. Go back and remember those things because that's what David did. Look at verse 37. He said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion. He's going back in mind. He said, hey, he's telling King Saul, God has already delivered me out of the paw of the lion. He fought a lion. Remember that? Got the honey out of his uh, uh, inside. And out of the paw, paw of the bear, he whipped a bear. So he is remembering his past victories and bringing these up now, just like we should do when we deal with things. Remember how God has blessed you before. Do you think he'll not do it again? Sure he will. He will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. He is pointing out here that God has prepared him for this victory that he's going to have over Goliath. Let me tell you, you and I are going to deal with things in life that's preparing us for something that's going to happen later on. As I go back in my mind, the Lord was preparing me a long time ago for my ministry that I had at the Corbin Hospital. He was preparing me for that a long time before I ever got there. Now, as I look back, I can see all that was developing in my life at the time. I didn't know. I, would, I didn't know what was ahead. But as I look back, I see, you know. So that's what Paul is, or David is telling him, you know, look back and see how God has blessed you before. So that's another spiritual uh, principle that we ought to learn from this lesson right here. Little battles 
get us ready for the big battles in life. So we got to deal with those things. So why do we not win the big battles in life sometimes? It's because we don't win the little battles. <laughs> That's the reason. And we're to win those. He tells us that. The Bible tells us that. So the next time you deal with something, remember how God has blessed you in the past. Remember how he healed you or how he worked in your life. And he will do it again. He just don't do it one time. He will do it again. The same God can give us victory over our present giants. All right, I've got to close this out pretty quick here, but I want to read this to you from 2 Corinthians chapter number 1 because it fits our lesson today. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead and delivers us from such a death, a greater death, and he will yet deliver us. In other words, you can have confidence Trust in God that he can deliver you from anything that you're dealing with in life. Sometimes he lets us go through these things in order to strengthen us for the big battle that's going to be down the road somewhere or to give us strength and to teach us to have more faith in him. We're to trust in him. That's what he wants us to do. No matter what age we are, he wants us to do that. So God help us if we'll do that. Past victories encourage us. Now look at verse number 38. We see the conquest here. And the victory is in the power of the Lord, is what he's telling us right here. He doesn't need Saul's armor. They want to put all this armor on him. You know what? He don't need that stuff. He don't want all that armor that, that King Saul wore that would cover him, and all these and all that stuff. He doesn't want that at all. Here's what, he, here's what he took. He laid aside all that armor. He goes down to the brook in the valley, and he took his staff in verse 40 in his hand, and he chose him five smooth stones out of the brook. They say those little stones were about the size of tennis balls. God had them there for him. Now, people say, why did he choose five? Now, there have been some speculation that said that Goliath had four sons. So maybe David thought, when I get through killing this guy, I may have to deal with his sons too. Now, whether that's true or not, I don't know. But I do know that he got five stones. It only took one of them to do, uh, to do the job. So here he is, just, he has a sling. That's what he got. He denies that spear. He could have had a spear that Saul carried. Now, I don't think it weighed 25 pounds like Goliath, but he could have had a spear to throw at this giant. He said, no, I don't want that. Don't want the armor, all that stuff. It's just going to weight me down is what it's going to do. So he takes a sling. You know, you think about it. Is that not a shepherd's tool? <laughs> That's what shepherds carried out there as they watched their sheep. They would take a sling, like a slingshot. I have got a cousin, Ralph Eaton, in Cincinnati. We used to squirrel hunt together. He can kill a squirrel with a slingshot. <laughs> it's amazing. I'm telling you, he can flat shoot. And I got an email one time about this guy. They would throw a quarter up in there, and he'd hit that quarter with a slingshot. I mean, that's just amazing. So this guy, David, had probably had plenty of practice of, at, at slinging uh, uh, rocks and things at animals that would come out there and try uh, to get his sheep. But he declined this armor. All he had was this slingshot. Now, verse 41, the Philistines came and they drew near unto David, disdaining him for he was but a youth and ruddy and a fair countenance. Verse 43, he said, Am I a dog that thou comest to me with staves? And the Philistine cursed David by his God. Who was his God? You know the kind of God that the Goliath had? A fish God. <laughs> That's who his God was. Beelzebub, that was one of, of his gods. So he's coming in the name of those gods against the God of Israel against the God that we worship today, boy, that ain't going to happen, is it? Verse 44, he says, Come to me and I will give thy flesh unto the fowls of the air. And he says, in other words, I'm going to feed you, David. I'm going to feed you to the buzzards when you come before me. Pretty scary stuff, isn't it? Not to David. <laughs> it, didn't, it didn't seem to bother him at all. Verse 45, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword and with a spear and with a shield, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. You defied my God. This day will the Lord deliver you into my hands. He says you can come with all the weapons you want to, but I'm coming in the name of the Lord. That's how you and I are to live today. We are to do these things in the name of the Lord. That the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. My ultimate weapon, David said, is the name of the Lord. That's our weapon today. We have spiritual battles today. And verse 47, he said, Lord, I want you to win this battle so you'll get the glory for the battle is the Lord and he will give you into our hands. So that's exactly what he did. David 
is running not from Goliath, but 48 tells us, verse 48, he's running toward him. He wasn't afraid of him. Now, this is a big obstacle there before David, and he was intimidated. So what does he do? Verse 49 says he goes right to the forehead of Goliath, and Goliath fell face forward. He is dead giant. A dead giant is who he is. And so he goes up, and he cuts his head off, and that's another story as well. But here is a lot of spiritual things we need to get from this. Our God is greater than anything that you and I face in life. We must remember that if God be for us, then who can be against us? We just trust God. We believe God that God will do what he says that he will do. You know, we're more than conquerors, the Bible says, through Jesus Christ who loved us. He knows all about your need today. He knows what you're going through. Maybe private things in your life that you haven't shared with anyone else. He knows all about that. Share it with him. Perhaps you don't share it with anyone else, but share it with him and ask him to go to work in your life. God cares about it. He loves us just as he loved David out there. And David let this obstacle not sway him one bit because he focused on the person who could solve that problem. The same is true for us today. We're dealing with a lot of stuff today. We're dealing with a lot of uncertainty in the days ahead. Just keep trusting the God in heaven, praying that God will change things. That's what we need to be praying for. Let's bow our heads together for a moment. We're going to have a, a moment of invitation. You know, one day, and by the way, when you open up your New Testament, the next person after you see the name Jesus is the name David. When you get to Revelation 22, the last, last chapter in the Bible, the last name you see there is the name David. So David's greater son is the Lord Jesus Christ who he went not to a valley, but he went to a hill called Calvary to do battle with an old giant named sin and death. So when Jesus shouted on that cross, it's finished. He abolished or cut off sin, the head of sin and death. He took the sting out of death for us. Now I can have victory every day of my life. Every giant that I face in life, I can have victory over him. Because I don't fight for the victory, I fight from it. Because the Lord has won that victory for us. We do it in his name. Are you trusting him today? Are you really trusting him for the needs of your life? Are you trusted him with your salvation? Do you know him as your personal savior? Make sure that you have him in your heart, that you know him in your heart, and that he's number one in your heart. That's, that's the place that he, that he must be in our life in order for him to work in our life, in order for us to be in his will. Is to be number one in our life. Is he in that spot in your life or is there other things there that you place before him are there other things more important to you than your relationship with Jesus Christ if there is you have your priorities out of order because when you face the difficulties they're going to overwhelm you if that's the case they're going to set you back they're going to cause you to have fear in your life so put Jesus back on the throne of your heart that's where he deserves to be. After all, he gave his life that we might have life and have it eternally. Father, I pray for these moments of invitation. I pray that there'll be decisions made today, perhaps to receive you as Lord and Savior or to, to draw up a little closer, a prayer of recommitment. Or maybe someone looking for a church home and this is where they feel God is leading them to be a part of a local congregation. Father, I just pray that your will will be done in our lives in these moments, and I pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand together if you would. We're going to have a moment of invitation. If God has laid on your heart a decision that you need to make, whatever that might be, I'll be here at the front. Would you come? Take up my cross and follow me. I heard my Would you come today? Would you come to him? Maybe you just need to come for a word of prayer. To ransom me, surrender your all today. He's 
greater than any need that you'll ever have. Trust him today. One more verse, and our invitation will be over. Maybe this verse is just for you. Maybe the decision you've been contemplating. Thank you for being here this morning. If you're visiting with us, inside or outside, we're certainly glad you come to worship with us at Poplar Grove. I'm going to go out and wave at those people outside. I didn't get to go out between the Sunday school and church, and I miss them, but we have a good crowd out there every Sunday. But isn't that amazing, the, <coughs> excuse me, the number of people that are watching our services? So you keep, keep inviting. Be smart through all this, okay? I'm not going to tell you to wear a mask. I'm not going to tell you not to. Just be smart, okay? My doctor told me to wear one, and I, I listened to him with everything else, and uh, so uh, I'm going to wear one, okay? I'm going to get my booster shot, because he told me to do that. Doctor, go for it. He just goes for everything. No, uh, take that back. Thank you for being here this morning. Look forward to seeing you at 6 o'clock tonight. I want to talk to you tonight about a slice of heaven. Look forward to seeing you at 6 o'clock. All right. Lead us as we go, Chad. Yes, I see.